Hello, everyone. I hope this message finds you well, uh, wherever you might be around the world. Our topic today uh, is the obese and super obese patients in continuation with patient challenges in laboratory anesthesia. I have no disclosure for you, and what I would like to do is concentrate on three main items. Uh, number one, describe some of the comorbidities uh, that are associated with the obese and super obese and how they might pose a challenge to us as providers and also describe some of the uh, expected uh, physiological and pharmacokinetic uh, alterations and how to mitigate uh, the, the risks that they pose to us and the patients uh, in order to provide, um, frankly, the best optimal care uh, that we can provide preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively for the patients. This is indeed one of my patients from about a year ago. The uh, patient was coming in for a neuroarthroscopy, uh, did fantastic. Um, of course, we made sure that the teeth were crossed and the eyes were dotted, and his uh, multiple uh, uh, comorbid conditions were controlled. Uh, also ensured that he was using his uh, CPAP mask uh, postoperatively. What we know about obesity, according to the World Health Organization, is that it has nearly tripled uh, since 1975. As of five years ago, uh, we had close to 2 billion adults uh, over 18 years of age uh, who were considered overweight and over 650 million who were considered obese. As of one year ago, um, there were over 39 million children under the age of five who were considered overweight or obese. Of course, obesity is preventable uh, and it is incumbent upon us uh, as providers to uh, educate uh, the patients as to the risks um, and how they can be prevented. With respect to the classification of obesity, uh, according to body mass index, um, anything over 30 uh, is considered obese, anything over 40, morbidly obese, over 50, super obese, and over 60, the super, super obese. Uh, according to the WHO classification, there are three different classes. Uh, class two uh, involves a BMI of 35 to 39.9, and class three, uh, BMI uh, over 40. We know that BMI does not tell us uh, the whole story, and the distribution of fat around the body does uh, make a difference, specifically visceral fat. Uh, we know that visceral fat is highly metabolically active, and these patients tend to be uh, hyperinsulinemic, uh, have systemic inflammation, and be uh, dyslipidemic. As one of my uh, mentors uh, has said, BMI or weight uh, should not be used as a sole determinant of suitability for laboratory surgery, and I completely agree. We need to take a look at the whole package. With respect to some of the comorbidities that are associated with the obese and super obese, uh, they basically affect just about every system of the body, from respiratory to cardiovascular to gastrointestinal, sudden death, uh, OSA, asthma, uh, gallbladder, um, the endocrine system, diabetes, vitamin deficiencies, uh, the musculoskeletal system, uh, malignancies, so the breast, prostate, cervix, and others, as well as psychiatric, so just depression. Some of the intraoperative considerations that we uh, must um, worry about is a difficult uh, failed mask intubation and or triple intubation. We know that these patients have a low FRC uh, as well as reduced chest wall compliance and the safe uh, sleep apnea period is reduced. There is difficulty in positioning uh, often uh, for these patients and um, anesthesia can indeed exacerbate some of the cardiac uh, comorbidities such as hypertension, mild health ischemia, pulmonary hypertension, or heart failure. These patients um, are uh, known to, to take uh, anorexigenic uh, drugs, not all of them, uh, but many do. This is a uh, fairly detailed list uh, also drugs. I know the print is very small. I included that here for your reference. But drugs such as fenfluramine or fluoxetine are associated with pulmonary hypertension as well, uh, as, well as cardiac bowel disease, so something to, uh, to look for. Some of the immediate post-operative considerations, uh, delayed extubation, uh, depressed respiratory drive, post-obstructive pulmonary edema, uh, post-op uh, delirium, and in some cases, an unanticipated hospital admission. And some of the post-discharge considerations, uh, again, uh, exacerbating some of the cardiopulmonary comorbidities, uh, renal dysfunction, rarely, um, but uh, having seen one in my career, rhabdomyolysis, DDT, uh, PE, and cervical side infection. The question that we uh, must answer is, can we self anesthetize obese and super obese patients for laboratory surgery? So we looked at some of the data uh, out there, and uh, some of you might be uh, familiar with the obesity paradox. 
uh, which tells us that obesity alone indeed is a significant factor for wound infection, more surgical blood loss, and longer uh, surgeries. However, um, it is associated with improved long-term survival. Very interesting. Those patients uh, that we're willing to worry about uh, are the underweight, which are the most at, uh, at risk. There is also no difference in outcome uh, between morbidly obese and super obese patients undergoing bariatric uh, surgery, um, and they have had similar anesthetic management. And we have several studies um, showing that obesity is indeed associated with lower mortality after percutaneous coronary interventions, non-cardiac surgery, heart failure, and acute coronary symptoms. Interesting data. Uh, we've heard from Dr. Chung regarding uh, OSA, but in essence, um, patients who have controlled comorbidities and are treated appropriately uh, for OSA uh, can do can do well. And um, uh, I, I, again, I, I, what uh, different from what I would expect, but these patients, you know, do indeed uh, do do well. The question again: Can we still be anesthetized obese and super obese patients for amateur surgery? Yes, indeed we can. But uh, we need to make sure that these patients are uh, assessed preoperatively um, in, a, in a thorough manner. Um, basic screening is imperative, uh, and targeted testing uh, is really in order. Uh, honestly, no, no need for extensive pre-op testing uh, for all patients. A fasting glucose and a lipoprotein level uh, should be performed in order to diagnose a metabolic syndrome. Uh, with respect to an electrocardiogram, uh, the patients are coming in for intermediate or hybrid surgery and are showing one or more additional uh, cardiac risk factors. Uh, we should consider doing one. Uh, spirometry, uh, in the presence of respiratory disease information, or what I say, could definitely be considered. And a stop band, essential, uh, since we know that 70% of obese and super obese patients are prone to ASA. There is emergent data uh, looking at airway ultrasound assessment, specifically mouth opening and skin to epiglottis uh, distance, telling us that uh, significant, stat statistically significant numbers are actually associated with a difficult airway. Interesting data uh, coming out on that, as well as with ultrasound gastric volume assessment. Uh, contradictory the data, uh, depending on the look uh, on the study that you uh, that you're looking at, and um, as we can imagine, uh, it can be technically uh, hard uh, to do as well. This is a uh, quick copy of a stall bank questionnaire that Dr. Chung uh, has discussed with us. Uh, essential um, preoperative for these patients. According to Samba, I had to deal with the OSA and uh, patients who are obese and super obese. Essentially, patients that have known OSA and have optimized comorbid conditions and are able to use CPAP after discharge uh, are okay to be uh, uh, are okay to proceed with ambulatory surgery. Patients that do not have uh, optimized conditions are, are not candidates for for such. Our intraoperative goal uh, should be to minimize sedatives for narcotics and emphasize regional anesthesia and rapid recovery. Um, sounds like a fairly general statement, but in terms of pre-medications, uh, try to avoid sedatives, uh, positioning, uh, elevating the head over 25 degrees specifically, that's what the evidence tells us, and possibly use Thrive or uh, buccal oxygen during intubation. Thrive stands for transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventral exchange, meaning that it would be used uh, as the lingoscope um, is being inserted in the mouth, and uh, has been shown to actually extend the safe uh, sleep apnea period to over four minutes. Neuromuscular blockade, uh, for those of us who uh, like to use Gamadex, um, the dosing of four milligrams per kilo is really indicated for uh, rocodrome-induced in uh, deep blockade. Uh, honestly, basic, but desflurane is less uh, lipophilic than sibofluorine and isoflurane. With respect to airway management, uh, Fascinating data, video assisted versus direct endoscopy. Uh, no reduction in failed intubation attempts or shorter times to intubation with the video assisted one. So I need to follow closely. The use of supraglottic devices. Uh, supraglottic devices are indeed safe uh, in the obese populations. Uh, in most cases, it helps us avoid uh, no muscle blockade with improved post op lung function. Uh, it also, also helps us in um, uh, reducing the uh, pressure response and better hemodynamic stability uh, in this patient population. 
postoperatively, uh, we should try to sit these patients up and keep the head elevated uh, for at 45 degrees whenever possible. Um, multimodal technique and trying to avoid the IM route for pain medication given the uh, rare uh, but existing risk of rhabdomyolysis. And uh, with respect to the refractory assessment, key. Um, making sure that uh, there's no hypopnea or, or apnea, even though we must be aware um, that the AHI peak at post of nine number three, according to uh, Dr. Chung's study uh, in the past. Uh, aggressive pulmonary toilet, and in some cases, considering home monitoring uh, for OSA. Interesting data. Uh, I have included the references over here for you. I look forward to an interesting discussion.